Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure to be here in such a esteemed company. The ETEC decision, which is the subject of our discussion this afternoon, generally concerns in large measure a very technical legal point on limitation. But that said, when we carefully analyze the merits of the decision, it reveals significant material lessons in corporate governance, particularly for directors on state boards and state enterprises. We start with a very brief summary of the facts that gave rise to the litigation in the first place. In June 2011, ETEC, through its then board of directors, claimed that a US $5 million investment by ETEC in Bamboo Networks Limited was wholly lost as a result of the negligence of its former directors, who caused the company to undertake the transaction without first carrying out proper due diligence on Bamboo, its financial state, and its business. Now, the defendants, who were the directors of ETEC at the time of the investment, um, and those would be the appellants of the Privy Council, so you have um, Julian and others, that's how the case is referred to, those directors asserted in defense that the claim brought by ETEC was statute barred. That is, it was a stale claim for the purpose of our local legislation. In reply, ETEC says, while it is the claim was brought outside the traditional limitation period, that is four years from the date of the course of action, they said that that limitation period was in fact postponed because of something we call deliberate concealment. And that is really what the procedural skirmish that occupies, that occupies the courts at all levels, going all the way up to the Privy Council. That is what it concerned. There was a very first skirmish before Justice Rampasad, where he said the limitation issue ought to have been dealt with as part of the actual trial of the substantive matter. And that was appealed and so on. And the Court of Appeal said, well, no, we disagree. We think that the limitation issue is one that defendants must be permitted to rely upon where it is open to them to do so. And the Court of Appeal directed that that limitation issue be dealt with as a preliminary matter. So it went back before Justice Ramasad. And when it went back before Justice Ramasad, Justice Ramasad held that the issue of postponement did not depend on what the directors of ETEC, or the former directors of ETEC, described as the notion of attribution. What they were saying is that the Minister of Finance, who in his capacity as corporation sole, was the sole shareholder in ETEC, they were saying that he was or ought to have been aware of this alleged negligence against the board of directors. And they're saying because he ought to have been aware, that ought to have been acknowledged, ought to have been attributed to the claimant in the matter, that is ETEC. So they're saying because the Minister of Finance knew or ought to have known of this alleged negligence, ETEC ought to have known about the alleged negligence, and therefore the, the limitation period was not postponed because it was not, it, it was not a case where the um, negligence was undiscoverable. The Court of Appeal agreed with Justice Rambasan, but they made a further point. So apart from dealing with the attribution issue, they also said that it didn't matter. The reason why it didn't matter is because the evidence did not show any circumstance where the Minister of Finance was triggered to conduct an inquiry into the circumstances giving rise to the alleged negligence. Now we end up with the Privy Council, and that is where we are on this decision. So the Court of Appeal decision was appealed, and the issues before the Privy Council were those primary two. That is the attribution issue, whether the knowledge of the Minister of Finance could be attributed to ETEC for the purposes of postponement of the limitation period, that's issue one, and issue two, whether on the evidence, if it is the knowledge could be attributed, whether or not the Minister of Finance had knowledge that could be attributed to ETEC in any event, such that the limitation period was not postponed. The starting point for all of this is Section 3 of the Limitation of Certain Actions Act of Trinidad and Tobago. And that prescribes that for actions in tort, which negligence is, those actions ought to be brought within four years 
from the accrual of the cause of action. Basically, when the grounds for instituting the claim first arose. But section 14 of that very same act is what gives rise to the issue that concerns the Privy Council. Section 14 says that if it is the party, the claiming party, can show that the negligence was deliberately concealed from their attention, such that they could not have known they could have brought the action, then the limitation period would not start to run until that negligence could have become discovered. Section 14.2 provides for a subset of that issue. And what it says is this. If the alleged negligence relates to a deliberate breach of duty, then once it is that alleged negligence was undiscoverable for a period of time, it would be treated as deliberate concealment. Let me break that down simply because that is where our discussion will largely focus. The, court is, the, the act is trying to say that even if it is the directors did not do something deliberate to conceal their negligence, they didn't, they didn't hide a document or something, if, even if they didn't do that, if their negligence itself was deliberate and that negligence could not have been discovered for some time, then that too would have the effect of postponing the limitation period. What was the director's position on all this? What were they really trying to say in answer to this notion of postponement? Especially when we consider the facts, because the facts were such that the original directors against whom the allegations of negligence were made were directors from 2000, well, in 2005 when the impugned decision was made up until 2010. In 2010, you had a change in government. In 2011, I think in 2010, you had an audit commissioned into ETEC. And then the new board of directors who would have commissioned that investigation, let me put it that way, would have discovered what, well, the, the claim was that that's that when they discovered this alleged negligence against the previous directors. And that started, or well, that was the genesis of the claim. So what the court then had to look at was this notion of attribution. And I spent quite a lot of time on that issue. And that I don't think is going to occupy too much of our attention today, except to say this. The court noted a marked distinction between shareholders on the one hand, the Minister of Finance being in that category as corporation sold, and directors on the other hand. And the Privy Council noted that shareholders do not owe the company the same level of duty or the same level of obligation that directors do. So the court is looking, for example, at Section 93 of the Companies Act and so on. And they're saying those directors have specific duties and obligations upon them to do certain things in relation to the company. That doesn't apply to shareholders. But the court recognized that this concept of attribution was a very technical one. And it was not an issue that lent itself to easy resolution. And interestingly, the Privy Council did not determine the issue of attribution. What they said was, because of the Court of Appeals decision, that it didn't matter whether the decision, whether the knowledge of the minister could be attributed or not, because it didn't matter, the court went ahead and said, even if it did matter, it made no difference at all. Because at the end of the day, the evidence did not show that the Minister of Finance was in a position to detect the cause of action, to detect the alleged negligence. So that is in summary, what that Privy Council decision was. But where do we see that linking to this notion of director's duties? Is it really that we are, we are just looking at a limitation point and advising um, various stakeholders on how that is to be assessed when you're looking at a claim of alleged negligence? The answer is no. Because once you start looking at that Privy Council decision as we're about to, you will start seeing where the court has due regard to the significance of directors' duties, the fact that they don't easily translate to shareholders, the fact that the attribution question may very well depend on those very same points. And when we come to Dr. Farrell's presentation in particular, we will see how this materially affects the interests of participants to volunteer for state boards and state enterprises in the first place. So with that, I think I will pass it back to the moderator to introduce our next presenter, 
uh, Mr. Ronnie Bissessa. Ali, thank you, and everyone, thank you for your patience and attention. Thank you very much, Christopher, for outlining the core aspects of the case. I will pass on to Ronnie Bissessa, who will now articulate to you some of the issues as it relates to um, just generally director's duties. And um, Ronnie, let me just pass over. Good. Thank you very much, Arlene. Um, Christopher, in his presentation, has admirably summarized the findings of the mm -hmm. Judicial Committee of the Privy Council of the JCPC, principally in relation to limitation periods um, for bringing claims against delinquent directors. Um, in my view, um, the, the perhaps the most significant um, component of the ETEC case is that it affirms that there is really no limitation period when fraud is alleged. Um, secondly, that notwithstanding attempts to hide or frustrate or suppress fraudulent activity, misfeasance is still punishable, um, assuming that shareholders and directors are diligent and vigilant in identifying misfeasance. And, 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 and the latter is really consistent with their fiduciary duties to the company. Having said that, um, I want to widen the discussions a little bit to discuss directors' duties, not only in relation to the ETEC case, which Christopher has admirably uh, referred to, but also to other recent judgments, for instance, the judgment of uh, Quinlan Williams J in uh, the Clico Investment Bank case um, and several others. But I also want to highlight some of the statutory provisions in our Companies Act, particularly, um, you know, bearing in mind, of course, that if for state directors, there, there are also duties owed under the integrity and public life um, legislation. And I know Terence will deal with some of those. It may well be, I think, um, fairly neutral to say that all directors, whether of private limited liability companies, publicly listed companies or state owned agencies or enterprises are fiduciary agents and are statutorily required to act in accordance with sections 99, 1 and 2, and section 60B of the Companies Act. And, and that underscores a director's obligation to act honestly, prudently, in the best interest of the company, and of course, to maintain oversight over the company's business and affairs. Um, the the, the, the ETEC case reinforces that. Um, and with that starting point, we, we of course are reminded that fiduciary duties are owed not only by every director of a company, but also by every officer. Um, and officers are defined in our Companies Act as including a general manager, controller, secretary, treasurer. In other words, irrespective of the, of the, of the nomenclature, once a person is, 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 is carrying out duties uh, of, of that character as a general manager, controller, or substantially similar functions, then that person is caught by the, um, the very same fiduciary duties that we are describing. Mm -hmm. So even if you're not a director, but you are a high level employee of a company, um, you are also to some extent susceptible or vulnerable to the legislation. In addition, of course, if you are a director of a state-owned um, agency, you are also described as a person in public life and additionally caught by the provisions in the Integrity in Public Life Act, um, the IPLE, in particular, the Code of Conduct. Um, all this means is that, um, is, is that in addition to the layering of the Companies Act, you are also required to adhere to the Code of Conduct in the IPLE. What this means really in relation to governance in the boardroom, which is really the high point of our discussions today, and, and, and this is in the court's view, is that it is equally important for directors and officers to be alive to the findings and influences of the court, uh, as well as the legislation as to what regulates fiduciary duties and obligations. And all of this is in the context that for, for at least most of the um, English speaking Commonwealth, Governance in the boardroom is not rule-based, but principle-based. This means that what you can or cannot do is not written in simple terms in any legal document, but requires an interpretation of principles rather than rules. And the JCPC in the ETEC case um, underscored that, at least for Trinidad and Tobago, much of our, our jurisprudence and, companies, and the Companies Act and Companies Law comes from the Canadian model rather than the United Kingdom model. So in determining what you are permitted or not permitted to do, 
it's useful to look at um, you know, cases from the Canadian jurisprudence, but also, of course, texts um, that speak to the Canadian model. Having said all of that, um, the trend is now clearly in favor of rule-based governance. And, and that's not only clear from the Companies Act, but also the, the Integrity and Public Life Act and the Code of Conduct, which defines ethical conduct so that directors and officers are, are, are more easily able to assess their governance in line with legislation and rules. Um, so if, if I can first just make the point that uh, as that is underscored in the ETEC case, in order to determine whether or not you are in violation of, 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 the, of your fiduciary duties, and you're looking primarily at rule-based governance, you need to determine, well, uh, am I in breach of any particular um, legislative provision? But equally, am I in breach of any of the common law requirements as set out in the various cases? It's not an easy task, but it does underscore as well the dynamic that is associated with governance at the board in the boardroom. Recent cases um, reinforces rule-based governance. And I can remind you of a few of them. Um, in the UTT case, this was a 2013 decision, just as Kokoram as it then was, um, considered whether directors acted prudently in failing to terminate a lease and identify the issues being whether the directors procured and acted upon expert advice and made the point at paragraph 57 of his written judgment that a breach of trust is, a, is in itself a violation of an equitable obligation. Um, significantly, the words which are used in that case of prudence, meaning acting prudently, as well as um, acting upon expert advice are two watchwords that I want us to carry forward in our discussions. Um, and, and that point was made in the ETEC case in the, in the, single, in the, in the first instance judgment of Rampasar J, um, which um, Christopher adverted to. Um, and that was not disturbed by the Court of Appeal or by the JCPC. And uh, Rampasar J described section 991 of the Companies Act in terms that while the duty of care is not owed by a director to a shareholder, there is a fiduciary duty owed by the director to the company and ipso facto its shareholders. Now, very significant because it, it, it and, and, and uh, I'm very keen to hear what um, Terence has to say later, because when we are speaking about shareholders, we are generally looking at where you have thousands or perhaps hundreds of thousands of shareholders. But I'm sure many of us would agree that for state agencies, you may have one shareholder or a principal shareholder as corporation sole. So one of the important points arising from the ETEC case is whether or not the governance thresholds I you know, uh, refer to there has same, the same or similar application to state-owned agencies where you have a single or a principal shareholder. Um, in that, in the ETEC case, um, the Privy Council at paragraph 52, in discussing the limitation point, uh, made this point. It, it said, section 14 of the Limitation Act is concerned not with the knowledge of claimants at a particular moment of time when taking some positive step, but rather with their knowledge or their means of discovering the relevant facts, exercising due diligence within some period of time after the occurrence of the breach giving rise to the cause of action. For me, uh, it, 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 it means in effect that you examine the quality of the information or material before the directors when they make their decisions. Bearing in mind, of course, that many of these claims or actions that are brought, um, but when there's a change of administration against the director, would be some years after the director has, has, has stood down um, and the, that director does not have access to minutes, does not have access to documents, and it may even be regarded as somebody who's a pariah in the company. And the question then is, well, what material or information do I have in my possession now that will meet the contentions um, of the company that I acted in breach of my, um, you know, of my, of my fiduciary duties? So you have to, in fact, test that in terms of the knowledge at the time of making the decision, which really means that when you make these decisions that you have to act on information which is reliable um, and accurate. And generally you should consider the expert, the views of experts. I'm not saying that you accept them unequivocally, but you should at least take into account these views and assess them in making a, a prudent decision. 
in, uh, in the T.N. Ramnov case, a uh, more recent um, the decision, uh, Justice Abood, and, and this matter is before the Court of Appeal, but uh, Justice Abood at paragraph 168 said that a breach of fiduciary duty can constitute an unlawful act for the purpose of a tort um, if such a breach is proven to be in concert with others and injures claimant. And in that case, um, was making the point that directors can act in concert or in, in conspiracy, if you like, with each other, provided that there is evidence to show a common intention. So it means that you are on the lookout as a diligent director, not only for a director acting alone, but where directors may act in concert to defeat or frustrate the best intentions of the company. And we are also reminded of, again, a, more, a recent case, a judgment of uh, Justice Mendonca in the CPEP case, CPEP and Dr. Rudal Munilal, where paragraph 48, uh, Justice P. Mendonca said, the board of directors are responsible for the management of the company. And it is within the board's powers, duties, and discretion to make a number of decisions that would impact on the business of the company. Um, that for me is important because um, it, it, it reinforces the notion of collectivity, um, that collective decision making means that um, it's not just in the hands of one director or those directors who you feel have more expertise in that area, but all directors. Um, I just want to close with a brief observations in terms of the, um, the decision in the Clico Investment Bank. It's a, it's, it's a, a judgment um, uh, which is very helpful and which I think is, is very useful as a supplement to the ETEC judgment. This was a, a very recent judgment of Justice Quinlan Williams um, in Clico Investment Bank versus Andre Montaya and others. And, um, and very briefly, she makes the following points. And I'll just go very quickly because I know I'm running out of time. The first point is that the courts treat with breaches of duties robustly and the onus of proof once an issue of fraudulent corporate conduct is raised shifts to the impugned director to defend his decision. This is in the context that by the time the matter comes to court, the director may have ceased being a director and there are no minutes or, and no conclusive record of the, to support a particular decision. Equally, and at paragraph 188, Quinlan Williams J said that directors are expected to perform their duties at a standard that is commensurate with their education, experience and knowledge in light of the circumstances known or those circumstances which ought to have been known by the directors. Very important statement. One of the very few cases I've seen throughout the Commonwealth where you in effect assess the decision-making from the point of view, not of, uh, of, of, of so much of, of the material that was before them, but the attributes and the qualifications of your directors. And it stands to reason that a director who is professionally qualified as an attorney, for instance, may have a harder task in, in persuading a judge that um, he does not or she does not have any knowledge of their fiduciary duties and obligations. In other words, um, you, you look at the attributes of the directors and assess whether they've reached the threshold based on, on that. Um, significantly, um, the, 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 in that judgment, um, the courts um, said that in fact, the courts agreed, Quillian Williams agreed that the courts are ill-suited and should be reluctant to second guess whether decisions made by directors are reasonable business decisions. Therefore, the court will consider the evidence of the director's business expertise to determine whether an appropriate degree of prudence and diligence was adopted in reaching what is claimed to be a reasonable business decision. And, um, and at paragraph 205 on one of my favorite lines, she said, in considering whether directors complied with his duty of honesty and good faith, the court will be guided by common sense principles. Now, I think we may not know, you know or exhaustively what is common sense principles or what are, but I, I think we can all see if it exists you know, when, when, it, when, when, when we examine it. Um, and, and those judgments reinforces the business judgment rule, which says or means that you would satisfy your duty of care if you take diligent steps to become informed in connection to what's being considered. You do not have any personal interest in the matter or you declare your personal interest. And most importantly, you have a rational basis to believe that the decision was in the best interest of the company. So in conclusion, and, and following up on the ETEC case, the limitation period does not 
protect you if you are acted fraudulently or right. you acted in breach of the um, your fiduciary duties. But it does mean that as a director or, or an officer of a company, you have to be diligent to follow through um, with with uh, in examining de decisions which you feel cannot be supported based on the best interests of the company. Um, because if you don't, then in effect, it is unlikely that the matters will be considered by the judge. Um, so, so Arlene, thank you so much for that opportunity and, and, and I hope it was helpful. Yes, thank you very much, Ronnie. And um, at the end there, you raised um, a point about the directors having a sense of what their duty is, what is right and wrong, we didn't really, the ETEC case really didn't give you the kind of information on how they performed and generally as a group, you know, it focused on the outcomes rather than some of the processes that might have been able to give us a little more insight. So uh, without Going on further, let me hand over to Dr. Farrell and then we go into general discussion. Yeah, um, thanks very much, Arlene. And, and let me um, <clears throat> start off by thanking Christopher. Um, I, I think we an excellent summary of the case and, and for Ronnie in his usual uh, excellent way of, uh, I mean, he's done so many times of, of, of really describing and, and talking us through uh, what director's duties are and what they mean and what the implications are. Um, the the ETEC the e case. Um, first of all, we have to understand that the ETEC case was not, was not tried on the on the on the um, on the on the issues, right? So that it was sent back to, to the court to be tried on the issues and then what the directors actually did or didn't do. Um, I, I, I want to I want to say though that uh, one of the the, the the points I've been trying to emphasize, I think, to participants in the CCGI over the course of the last many years is that being a director of a state enterprise or even a statutory corporation or statutory body um, is different from being a director of, the, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a private company. Uh, it is different and it is more difficult it is more challenging. It is actually, in my view, more risky for people to become directors of state enterprises. They, they, and, and I think in the last 20 years, in the context, Trinidad Tobago context, there are two things that have emerged which have highlighted the, the risk. But let me let me back up by us by, by pointing out why it is the state enterprises were created or have been created. Uh, they've been they've been around for a long time. In Trinidad, the earliest one was back in 1957. But they actually using state enterprises to carry out government policy and so on really took off from the 1980s. Uh, there have been periods where they have the numbers have shrunk because, for example, under the IMF and World Bank programs in the 1990s, uh, the, those programs caused the government to shut down a lot of the state enterprises because they were costing too much money and they were imposing a, a, a charge on the fisc and so on. But then as soon as we came out of those programs, again, we had a large number of, of, of state enterprises being created and so on. So the government has a will to increase the, these, 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 these entities. And they call them all kinds of names, special purpose entities and all kinds of things and so on. Now, there's a reason why they do that, why they've done it. And the principal reason why governments have, have adopted the state enterprise mechanism was, uh, was to get around the Central Tenders Board Act. And because when you create a state enterprise, you incorporated a, a company under the company's ordinance, but owned by the corporation soul. And we'll talk about corporation soul in a second. Uh, they, they, that, that entity <clears throat> did not have to follow the Central Tenders Board's rules and strictures. It could go out and it could do procurement uh, pretty much as it, as, it, as, it, as it wanted to. And the governments loved that because it meant that they could do things with, 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 with these enterprises. Now, they, 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 so this is where I think the problem uh, arises because what you have is that you have entities that are created and incorporated under the Companies Act uh, and uh, are intended to operate in that kind of fashion. So all of the things that Ronnie has said 
about director's duties and fiduciary duties and the relevance of section 99 and, uh, and, and, and section 16 and so on, is what is supposed to apply to a company that has been created under the company's ordinance. State enterprises are peculiar beasts. They are peculiar beasts because they are owned by the state. And in specifically, uh, what happens is that we have uh, a piece of legislation called the Minister of Finance Corporation Soul Act, which actually dates back to the 1970s, I think it's 1973. And what that does is that it vests all the assets of these entities in this person called the Corporation, Minister of Finance Corporation Soul. Minister of Finance Corporation Soul becomes the shareholder. But the reality is that the Minister of Finance in his, even in his capacity, the Minister of Finance as Minister of Finance, as Minister of Finance as Corporation Soul, even in the capacity of Minister of Finance Corporation Soul, he, he does not exercise necessarily any direct control as the controlling shareholder of these entities. He may have actually have absolutely nothing to do with the enterprises at all. Typically, these enterprises will fall under the the, 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 the charge of one or other minister. It might be Minister of Trade, it might be the Minister of Labor, it might be the Minister of, of whatever. And so a number of these ministries have responsibility for particular enterprises or entities which fall, which are which are which are put under, under their purview. And ultimately, it is the cabinet that is responsible for what these enterprises do or don't do it. Is it the cabinet that is supposed to instruct them in terms of what their purpose is? And I know Nigel Romano likes to, he likes to talk about purpose. It is the cabinet that is the government of the day, which tells these enterprises what they are supposed to do. Uh, they are supposed to produce strategic plans. They're supposed to achieve certain kind of objectives and so on. So uh, there, there is a problem, if you can see the problem here, the problem is that the notion of the shareholder, which comes out of company law, is a very peculiar notion when you take it and transplant it into the world of the state enterprise, okay? And this is the problem that you have now with the ETEC case. ETEC is an entity which was under the Ministry of Trade and Industry, okay? So ETEC is an enterprise which is intended to promote industry. They appoint a board, so Ken Julian and a bunch of other directors, people like Eugene Thier, and a very, very competent board actually, uh, of people who were put onto this board. They set about, um, given the purpose which should be there to charge it, made an investment uh, with, with in, in this company called Bamboo, which, which, which Christopher talked about, uh, and that, that investment um, went south, right? They lost um, um, $5 million or whatever it is and so on, right? Now, now they, 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 they said that they had done due diligence uh, on the entity, and... Uh, uh, but it's still, it's still lost the money. Now, I want to stick a pin here and point out that in a private sector context, companies lose money, directors make bad decisions, and they lose money all the time. That is normal. I've been, I've been a director of many private sector entities, and you make investments, and some of them are successful, and some of them are not. Uh, and, and, and when they are not, what happens is that you go at the annual meeting and you tell your shareholders, well, we lost money on this and we made money on that. And at the end of the day, if I deliver results for my shareholders, I get a pat on the back and so on. But if, I, if, if, if shareholders find that I am not discharging my responsibilities and I'm making too many bad investments, I can leave. The other thing I would point out is that when it comes to the question of due diligence, when we are acquiring a company or conducting a merger, what the directors are do, supposed to do is they're supposed to do what is called due diligence, which has a number of different forms. There's financial due diligence and legal due diligence and so on. You hire a firm and they come in and they help you to do the due diligence on the target and so on. And typically, certainly in my own experience, and I think in the experience of most people, is that when you've acquired the entity or when you've done the merger, you find all kinds of things come up which did not emerge in the due diligence process. But that's par for the course, quite frankly. It, it, it happens. But you can at least go back to your shareholders uh, if questions arise and say, yes, we did the due diligence. One of the issues that arises in this ETEC case is whether or not the due diligence was sufficient, whether it was mm -hmm. adequate, whether it was sufficiently detailed, which is a question that had to go back to the judge to be tried. 
Now, the other question that, 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 that Christopher talked about is this very interesting question called attribution. In other words, when did the shareholder know, or when does a shareholder know what the directors know? When is the, 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 the knowledge uh, that the company should have can be attributed to the shareholder of the company? Now, the, the, the Inquiry Council didn't answer that question. So it's a very interesting question. A number of pages of the judgment I try to address that question. And it's a very important question. It hasn't come before us, but somebody needs to answer that question. And maybe it will come up at some other point in time when we will have to answer it. But if you think about it, the ways in which state enterprises work in Trinidad, and I dare say everywhere else, is that state enterprises can and do not make decisions that do not involve either the line minister, the permanent secretary, minister. or the line minister, or ultimately the cabinet. So the, or, uh, the, although the minister of finance is the shareholder, the question is, uh, doesn't the government know that this investment was made? Didn't the minister or some minister or the line minister know that this investment was made and therefore sanctioned it, in fact? The, 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 the appellants, that is the Julian and the, and, the, and, the, and the outgoing board, indicated that yes, we did tell the cabinet that, it, that we were making this investment and the cabinet approved the investment. So the question of attribution in the context of a state enterprise, where you have a state enterprise performance manual, which says that when you, you, you know, in, in fact, um, if, we, if we have a second, I could probably just, just share um, that what that looks like in the um, in the state enterprise performance manual. All right, so if you could see that screen in terms of what that is. But this, this diagram here comes out of the state enterprise performance manual. And there you see very clearly at the top of it is the cabinet. And the line minister, and you see the minister of finance corporation, so who is the nominally the owner or the shareholder, uh, the Minister of Finance Investments Division, then the Board of Directors, and then the Management of the State Enterprise. This is what this is what uh, is in the manual. So therefore, the question of, of, of when did the minister know, or the minister means Minister of Finance, does it mean the Minister of Trade, does it mean the Cabinet? When did they know, what did they know, and when did they know it, is a question that in the context of state enterprises becomes a very... Um, I should say interesting question, a very kind of murky question, because if they follow the state enterprise performance monitoring manual, which the ETEC directors claim that they, that they did do, then clearly the government knew and the government would have in some sense sanctioned the investment that was made. But the other risks, so we have, we have, we have, we have um, two key risks here that for, for the state enterprise directors. One is the integrity in public life legislation which came in in the mid 2000s, it was there before, but in terms of its new form, came in in about 2005, which I think poses important risk for state enterprise directors in terms of the declaration of assets and in terms of uh, the fact that you can be investigated even up to five years after you've left. But a new risk has emerged for state enterprise directors, whereby if you are a director of a state enterprise and the new government comes into power, and you, uh, you leave because our practice in Trinidad certainly has been that when a government changes, all of the directors of state enterprises immediately resign and the new government is therefore has a clean slate and they can appoint new directors. The incoming directors in the case of not just ETEC, but in another case, which I think also concerned, uh, which concerned Petrotrin, turned around and instituted litigation against the former directors on the basis of whatever, negligence or whatever. And uh, it poses a risk for you as a director in a situation like that, because you could find yourself in a situation where uh, a new set of directors come in and for whatever reason, whether it is politically motivated, whether it is in fact due to the fact that there may have been fraud, uh, Ronnie's absolutely right, right if there is fraud, there is no question of limitation. Limitation simply doesn't arise. But it could be that uh, that you, you, you were negligent. Indeed, you were negligent. 
and it was not discovered or that you attempted to conceal the negligence and so on, but you could find yourself exposed as a, director, as a director outside of the company without having access to the information, to the data, and to decisions which uh, you, you need to rely on for your defense. Because remember, the government has changed. There's a new cabinet in place, there's a new minister, a new line minister, and so on. And you may find yourself in real jeopardy uh, as, a, as, a, as a state enterprise director. So to my mind, the ETEC the, 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 the e um, case uh, shows up a, 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 an important issue. Um, I, I chaired a state enterprise review committee back in 2016. We recognized this as a problem. It's a problem for the directors of state enterprises. And if you want to have, as we have having the previous panel, we talked about having qualified people and so on, appropriate people to come and serve, uh, and people want to serve on, 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 and do public service and, 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 and so on. If you want to do that, you've got to solve two problems for state enterprise directors. You've got to deal with the integrity in public life legislation in terms of its demands on directors, but you also now have to deal with this issue of incoming directors when governments change coming and litigating um, against you. Now, how do you solve that second problem? If you can solve it, you can't pay people do fraud, they need to be, to be charged and they need to, uh, to, to go to court and so on. But the, the issue I think really relates to the governance structure of state enterprises. And I'm saying that you cannot take the Companies Act model and just simply put it on to state enterprises and then tell directors you must behave as if you are, are operating in a private company. Now, there is a model which does that. And that model is the Norwegian model. In Norway, the Norwegian government tells directors of state enterprises, listen, you are governed by the Companies Act in Norway. We appoint you, but after that, you are entirely subject to things of concerns and strictures that Ronnie talked about in his presentation. And we are going to hold you to that standard. We are going to hold you to the principles of governance as if you were a private sector entity. There is another model, which is the model that we advocated in the Civil Enterprise Review Committee, which is the New Zealand model. And the New Zealand model recognizes that state enterprises are indeed very peculiar animals. They're different animals from a private sector company. They have a different kind of purpose. They have, a, they have the, uh, the elements of a public purpose uh, for some of them. The government may have certain kinds of objectives that it wants these enterprises to carry out. Uh, and they may want to have them carried out in a particular kind of way. So what the New Zealand model does is that it says, listen, we will incorporate you under the Companies Act, but we will then, we have a separate piece of legislation, which is called the State Enterprise Act, and we will now deem you to be a state enterprise under that act, which has a different regime, a different set of government pr governance principles to which we are now going to hold you. And we advocated that model for Trinidad and Tobago, that that's what we should do. And if we did that, then situations like the ETEC situation, like the Petrotrin situation and so on, in our view, are unlikely to arise uh, as it did and caused, um, I, I think, um, unfortunate consequences, I think, for some of the directors uh, of these enterprises. So, Arlene, I want to stop there and I would love to hear what some of the comments and questions are into. Okay. Very good. So, but before we go to um, questions, I just want to say that, you know, as, as I read the case, passing through a lot of the legalese, I recognize that there are instances when um, it referred to the knowledge of the Minister of Finance, given, as Terran said, the structure of the state enterprises in Trinidad and Tobago, he would have known. Even if they didn't go to him directly, he would have known as a member of cabinet. And uh, um, the case spoke to presentation before FNGP, where a number of questions were asked that needed to be clarified. And the Minister of Finance chaired the Finance and General Purposes Committee. So it's very possible that the Minister of Finance at the time would have asked um, a number of questions. Were they all clarified? 
um, we are not sure. But it, I mean, all of this speaks to the fact that we, Trinidad and Tobago, are in a place, if we are to move, and this I think is a bigger picture, if we are to move forward, absolutely changes need to be made in our state enterprises structure. And that has to do, um, one of the things that came up this morning spoke to there are different kinds of state enterprises. Yes, and you have statutory bodies, you have the normal state enterprises, then what they call special purpose companies. And Terence is right, it was to get around <laughs> the central tenders board ordinance at the time, you know, that a lot of these were created. I think they just went overboard because when you look at the number of state enterprises and the duplication, and I think the Ministry of Trade, for instance, is now trying to see if it could uh, diversify and create smaller companies, and they've done it already, but they're still working on merging them possibly into one and minimize the duplications. We have to give the ministries and departments, we have to give what is government the tools with which to govern properly. And to do that, it has to come from government. How do we change that? I am not sure, you know, because it, it really has to come from the government's will to look at models that can better serve Trinidad and Tobago and the interests of the people and make the change so that you don't have, and I wouldn't, uh, the word frivolous is coming to mind, but it's not that it was frivolous, but the, the fact that as the government changed, yes, this happened, and, and you wondered why, because when I read the document, the process was followed. They said that they did their due diligence, whether it was robust enough is a question we have. They followed the process and went through their minister and went to cabinet on more than one occasion. One of the things they didn't do is that they decided to act before the confirmed decision was out, because that confirmed decision, my um, um, tenure could change, and then your neck is in a noose, so that you should really wait on the confirmed decision before making a decision like that to pay out what was US $5 million. Um, and yes, it may be that in private companies, it's um, it happens, but when you look at government and the public purse, it was a significant amount. Good. So as we go forward, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat, but one of the questions I have given, and I, I looked at one or two articles in the newspapers and they showed you the board and Terence referred to it. It was a fairly mature and professional group of directors who should have known um, at ETEC. What could they have done differently, if at all? Um, did we have enough information? I don't know if anybody has any background information on the fact that um, they adhered to or pursued their um, fiduciary duty in the best manner. Were there any dissenting voices? Um, at all, and did the chairman, because we know Professor Julian would have commanded an authority, um, did people have an opportunity to say yea or nay, or even ask questions? Maybe we will never know, but um, could they, is there anything that they could have done differently with respect to what happened eventually? I don't know if anyone wants to <laughs> broach that because it's very general. And, and for I think, my, I think, I think, um, I think it's, it's hard to say because I think remember yeah. the the, um, 
the, the, the actual trial of those issues and so on um, had been sent back to, 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 to try those issues. So we really don't know uh, exactly. All, all we know is what, what the Privy Council judgment has kind of, has kind of said. Right. Mm -hmm. um, what happened is when I went to first instance with um, um, the Vindra Rampasad, who is who's an excellent judge, by the way, who is very um, strong in, in commercial matters and so on, um, the, 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 the attribution question and limitation question, which are really kind of very legal uh, points, were the points which kind of emerged and then they were grappling with those. The precedence. The council. Um, but but I, I, what, I, what I would say um, to try to kind of not to answer your question, but to help pose the question a little bit, is to, is to emphasize the point that in the case of state enterprises, um, the, the decision-making process is in fact very different. In the case of a private sector entity, the decision ends at the level of the board of directors. That's where it ends. You, you, you don't have to go to, you have to go anywhere else to make a decision. If you want to, if you want to acquire a company and it costs whatever it costs, right? That's where the decision ends. And you account to your shareholders after the fact at an annual meeting and say we did this or we did we did X or we did Y. This was successful. This was not. And companies make mistakes. I mean, I've been on the board of many companies, and many of these companies you, you lose money. They are not necessarily publicized in terms of when we when we when we when you lose money. In the case of a state enterprise, the decision making process is different, and it does not, as I, as I, as the state enterprise performance manual and the, and the diagram I showed points out, it does not end with the board of directors. It has to involve the, yes. the you know, you are permanent secretary. It has to involve the permanent secretary. It has to involve the, the the line minister. It has to go to cabinet. It has to come back from cabinet. It has to be a confirmed minute, as you quite rightly point out, and if. You and if you are a private sector director and you have no understanding of the public sector and how it works, the idea of a confirmed minute would not be something that occurs to you. That, no. You want the public service <laughs> to know that cabinet makes a decision today and then at the following cabinet meeting, that previous decision is then confirmed. And as you quite rightly pointed out, there are many instances when minutes are changed or they right. Uh, additional uh, information uh, comes to hand exactly for whatever yeah, kind yeah. of reason or some somebody in the cabinet decides that they don't want to do that anymore um and 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 so therefore if you uh if you come from the private sector and you set about as you know in the case of e-tech and you want to make these investments and so on this was a technology company that they mm -hmm. wanted and you want to get on with it because this is something that 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 you know that you consider to be urgent you will act like if you you in the private sector and you can get yourself tripped up in terms of these public sector processes and cause you grief. I see Faye's hand is up. Hey, yes, if I may. Gosh, I have um, a number of thoughts coming out of all this. But I guess the first part, the first sort of comment I have is we we Terry keeps emphasizing that the case has gone back. To, to be determined on the merits. I mean, is that happening? Or has the administration changed and therefore the case is now off the agenda? And is that what happens? You get sued and you, you indulge in delaying tactics until you get a new administration, administration in place. Just, um, I, and, <laughs> that's what that's happened in the, in the Malcolm Jones case. Malcolm Jones case was eventually a kind of Squash. I don't know what has happened in this particular case, actually, the ETEC matter. I don't know if Christopher knows. I was not going to say that. Um, I, so I don't know what the status is. I actually sent a message to one of the advocates who were involved in the matter. He has not yet responded to tell me what the current state of case management is. As far as I know, the matter did go back before Rampasad J and is in active case management. So directions have to be given now for dealing with the substantive merits of the case going forward. If, if it is messages me while this is ongoing, I was so so there you. may yet be an opportunity to know what the determination they may is yet be. merits. They may yet be. one one of the yeah. other questions, Terry, Terry asked, or somebody asked, so I'm like, so so what do you do as a director of a state enterprise? And I think the directors of was it NGC have demonstrated you asked for an indemnity in advance, right? <laughs> you cover your you you try to cover your basis, but it, it does it, it it does throw up those kinds of things where directors are, are not really able to to operate on a 
a commercial basis because there were all these problems that, that could arise. You get judged by a different administration. I think that's part of the problem. You're not judged by the same administration that um, put you out. Then I, but I disagree with you, Terry, as to whether the Companies Act is the, is the appropriate vehicle. I, I think that it needs to, as you say, for whether you adopt the New Zealand model or that you have the company there, but then you have additional regulation or law governing it because, you know, um, you have private companies. We, we tend to think when we think of a company, of a, a public company that has this obligation to um, numerous shareholders, but those are the minority, really. You know, we have over like a hundred plus thousand private companies out there, which have, you know, that then there's nothing regulating them. We tend to judge everybody by this um, the standard of the public listed company. My final comment is that, I mean, I've basically found today pretty depressing so far because it really demonstrates, I know this state enterprise discussion has been going on for decades. It's, it's, it's not new. And the point Terry made this morning about the um, integrity in public life legislation, that you pass this legislation, which you set it up to fail. The beneficial ownership legislation is completely unenforceable. It completely that if you if you really dig down as to how that gets enforced you will realize that that is not designed to be enforced that's designed to tick some some boxes so where do, where do we begin to change that and i think that's some of the questions that we'll ask this morning and and this is probably opening up a whole other corner's nest but i think we have to come back to education and, and having things like ethics and and, and those kinds of discussions at, in a school level, rather than teaching kids stuff that they go on to Google and, and find out and do a YouTube, you know, information and education just needs to be treated differently. But we're not talking about education. I accept that. And I accept <laughs> it's probably a whole other area of, of discussion. But, uh, but I do think that the change in a way, yes, it has to come from the top, but it, it also needs to come from below. Because otherwise, we train kids and young people coming up in, in these behaviors. And I will shut up now. Can I, can I ask, um, can I ask you yes. why the beneficial ownership is completely unenforceable? Oh, you want Please to know? Wow. Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> the, no, I don't know. Um, I manage a genuine Okay, so, so, so the way it's unenforceable is that Right now, the way they, they try to enforce it for the company's registry tries to force the company to get the um, shareholders to provide this information. And the company's responsibility is to use its best endeavors or, or words to that effect, right? Um, and, but, but they can't pull blood from stone. So if the shareholder refuses, then the company's registry has to take that shareholder to court. So this is not a, like a, a fine or, a, you know, that, that they could just fine you. So they have to take the shareholder to court and go through the whole um, court process to be able to establish that that person is in breach of the act. And, you know, are they gonna do that for the hundreds? I mean, if you have 100,000 private companies, you have 200,000 shareholders at least. So it's, hmm. it's one of those things that people who do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, you know, hmm. who obey laws will do it. But so many of us are kind of waiting for, for some kind of change to come into place that will make it a more sensible piece of legislation. Well, but I don't point, think I it's think intended like... to <clears throat> take effect. Well, that's a similar point on the integrity in public life act because the, 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 if you if you don't declare right, and they put your name in the papers and after that, then the integrity commission then has to go to the court. And if you have there are 1,600, 1,700 people who are under this piece of legislation, <laughs> it, was, it was unworkable when it started with 700. It's now gone to 1,700. And no, how are you going to take these people to court to be able to get <laughs> the court to get them to file the declaration? It's, 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 that's why I say it's, it's, it's set up to not work. Yeah, yeah. Um, in the chat, Simone indicated civics. But before that, I want to just 
read Antonia's comments. She said to Dr. Farrell's point about recognizing the difference in the types and purpose for state enterprises, does this not also suggest that there is need to look at the path to final approval? Short answer is yes, it does. Surely the ones that are required to operate on a commercial basis should have some sort of expedited approval or perhaps a standing review committee with known timelines so that the board and management could factor the approval of time frame into their decision-making process. And this is where possibly I think um, just initially before um, I let the panel discuss, the, this is where, um, oh, the point just went. Um, purpose. It's not also suggested to look back to final. But, but, to that, but, to, but, that, but to that point, Arlene, um, uh -huh. you know, I mean, we had Ken on this morning, and you know, Ken, <laughs> a lot of it depends on what and who the minister is, you know. So, one of the things that we know about state enterprises and state enterprise governance in this country is that if a state enterprise is not giving any trouble, which means to say that it is like it's not losing money or it is not losing money excessively. It, 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 it goes into a situation of kind of benign neglect. It's, it's there and they don't worry about it. It is only when you have problems that attention yeah. is paid to. So like, for example, during the coronavirus, you see the COVID-19 thing with Cal, Cal has to shut down, start up, lose money. And, and so therefore the government has to pay attention to it. And the government then has to take several hundred million dollars and put it into Cal because you want to keep Cal flying and you want it to survive the period and so on. So if the enterprise is squeaky, like the education facilities company, which has now gone into, into, into bankruptcy, if it is squeaky, the government pays attention to it. But if it is not squeaky, they just kind of just leave it and, 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 and let it run. NGC, for example, is a very different kind of entity because an, an, an NGC was a cash cow and still is a cash cow for the government. And so the government paid attention paid to it. Attention. It paid attention to who it put on the board of NGC and paid attention to the dividends it was able to extract from NGC for that, for that reason. In the case of First Citizens, Ken was the chairman at one point in time. And as I said, there was a particular government minister and so on. And Ken wanted to travel somewhere. And the minister said, well, you know, you want to travel somewhere, you have to ask me. <laughs> and of course, he was very upset about that, and I think he eventually resigned. You know. Yeah. Just um, to go back there, the, it's when we say look at the path to final approval, it is not just process and approval. I think it goes back to um, Dr. Farrell's review of Trinidad and Tobago having a different model, or else we'd be just marking time we won't be going forward we'd be marking time and i'm saying that because there are so many issues now from partisan um persons appointed to boards who are not suitable to not being trained to the political whatever the government not and it doesn't have to be legislated you know it could be policy stating that if you are appointed to a board, each board must ensure that their directors are trained and qualified. And okay, it will take a process for us to get to the place where persons on the list um, have the certification necessary, but you have persons who have, okay, general qualifications, but they have no clue how a board operates especially a state enterprise, but they're willing to contribute, but you don't tell them how. So even in terms of small steps, ensuring that your board members know what their duties are, what they are, um, know what the organization is about, what their responsibilities are and the risks, okay? But you're therefore working towards ensuring that the risks are not there. Yes, commercial um, entities that provide um, finance to government 
will they probably will look at and they have been looking at that differently but i know that there are some instances where it's um an entity a state enterprise might be significant because you're trying to help the persons within a community and you have to even beg the ministry of finance for funds for them to be able to operate however they are a state enterprise and they continue to operate and not necessarily do things as they should and some of their directors wants to be paid in advance it is we we have so many different little issues that keep us back from performing well and then at the end of the day you're held accountable for non-performance so it, it, it is between sometimes a rock and a hard place. We have owner here with, um, and I'm not sure, well, if um, at, after owner, if Antonia wishes to, you know, at least say anything further on her point, we can have that. Owner. Okay, thank you, um, Arlene. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, I just jumped in this session because I was um, doing training somewhere else, but something that you said um, came to mind and made me raise my hand because I'm in Barbados and the issue that you were discussing, um, I mean, I, I just had to tell, um, suggest to the powers that be that perhaps there needed to be some sort of workshop or some sort of training opportunity before you appoint, when you, when you decided that you're gonna appoint these people to the boards of state-owned enterprises, that perhaps you needed to undergo a workshop, a familiarization workshop, where you explain to them the basics of what their duties and responsibilities are, what is expected of them, what they're supposed to do. And I don't know if this point was raised already, but far too often, and this is from where I sit, I see people who come, yes, they're willing to serve, they're willing to sit on the board, but as you said so correctly, they have no clue. And then, you know, they, they don't, the best practices are not there, they're not observed. And I think it's, it's really a disservice to them to just throw them in and you don't provide the training or help them to understand what is required and what the, the duties and responsibilities are. So that's just my intervention. I just wanted to say, yes, I, I hear you. Yeah. I hear you. I understand the challenges that you are raising in terms of Trinidad, but it very much happens in Barbados as well. Yes, yes. Um, Margaret, I see wanted to uh, um, speak um, a little further. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what I, I was, my hands are very slow in the typing, so... <laughs> but what I wanted to say is, based on the conversation that was happening, I just thought that we could probably have this conversation of revisiting the, the, the manual, the state enterprise manual, and instead of having a one size fit all, we can look at the different types of state enterprises and categorize them. It will force us probably some of them, as I said, to put together and become one. Some of them might have to probably be removed because it may not, it may have already fulfilled its purpose, but it's to have them in categories and then design the policies and the guidelines to suit that category, which will capture what Antonia was saying in terms of how we do approvals, but it's not only how we do approvals um, and make decisions and some, but it's in, in, in encompassing how those enterprises are gonna be guided. And I, that was my comment. Okay, a little easier said than done. <laughs> we have well, actually, said no, no, actually, Arlene, it was very, very, it's very easy. In fact, so uh, the committee that, 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 that uh, was in, uh, in 2016, we categorized the enterprises. Okay. So we had four categories. We had what we call strategic enterprises. So, for example, CAL would be considered to be strategic. Right. Strategic commercial. First citizen is strategic commercial enterprise. Commercial. Then we have what we call what we call developmental enterprises. So ETEC, for example, was one free zones company. Uh, in other words, any any TTIFC. These were companies that were given a developmental mandate uh, to do something to promote something in the economy. And then we had what we called social enterprises. Okay, mm -hmm. these were enterprises that were carrying out some kind of social service, service right? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, there, there was some overlap in some of them and so on. There are some very funny, strange ones like Export Centers Limited, handicraft and, and, and so on. 
And uh, among our recommendations were recommendations that related to the fact that we had a number of different enterprises doing the same thing. So you had Invest TT and Export TT and Free Zones Company and TTIFC all basically doing the same thing, which is investment promotion. And our recommendation was, well, look, collapse all of those things, put them into one, you will save a lot of money, you will um, get the best resources, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we did do that. We did categorize them because they do have to be looked at differently in terms of government subventions to these entities. And certainly the strategic commercial ones, you really got to treat them different, you know, differently. like Cal and so on, uh, and right. just be treated very differently. But at the end of the day, they all operate within the guidelines of the operations manual. Almost all. I don't think Cal may have that limitation or even NGC, but most of the others, even though categorized differently. So the point Margaret was making, I think, in terms of the having various, not just policies, but processes for the various, you know, state enterprises um, would be critical. And it it really needs the will of government to change it, to make it more robust. Even as we look at Jamaica, the previous session spoke to their um, public bodies, um, legislation and, and regulations. And it has been there for a while. If people have breached it, and as people breach it, or as I should say state enterprises breached it, they have rethought how it is structured to tighten some of those breaches. So a number of the policies, procedures, and um, documents we put out there, it is not a one-stop shop. It has to be um, a, roving, a moving document because we're living in a world that is moving around us. And therefore we need to be always considering are we on the right track? Is this working? How, what kind of changes do we need you know, to make? We, we have a lot of work to do and we have been talking and maybe at the end, coming closer to the end, we need to look at, can the C, CGI work together? And that call was put out with the Integrity Commission to do something further or, or put something forward with the Ministry of Finance, even the recommendations that Terence spoke about, you know, from the committee that have not been implemented. Uh, the, some of the information is there. How can we use it to make it work for us, for it to be done differently? Um, I have Antonia's hand up. Yes, thanks, Aline, um, for allowing me to come back and, and talk. Uh, I stand very solidly behind um, all the points that Dr. Farrell has raised about the, the categorization uh, and, and, right. and segregating how we approve. Now, at the end of the day, um, the other models of state enterprises um, that, that can be considered. Uh, now, I personally lean to the one um, like uh, South, in South America, like the Petrobras, where you have public-private boards so that you, you delink the, the board's tenure from the government administration of the day. Um, for the very reason that you do have boards who feel that their onus is to the, um, the, 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 the directive of the government administration. Mm -hmm. And so they, they make bad decisions. The other thing we have to look at is the linking the approval process um, from the, the slow path of, of government decision making, uh, particularly when you are in the commercial space. But at the end of the day, how do we do that? Because who is held accountable at the end of the day and who is going to pay the price when there is a bad decision? And it comes back typically to the government, the certain government of the day who was not party to having to fork out taxpayers' dollars to pay the penalty for bad decision-making of a past board or past administration. And so somewhere in that space, there needs to be better oversight. And one thing that I would like to see change 
is the turnaround time for uh, of oversight because the, the we have the public um, um, accountability committee, but those reviews are what every five seven years. It's too long, and so by the time anything could be unearthed and discovered, the, the 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 parties have gone, the damage has been done, and there's no way to catch it. So the I, I have no problem with the state enterprise monitor and manual. I actually thought it was a very good initiative. Um, yes, NGC does follow it, um, but I have seen. Um, all these state enterprises I have worked with do follow it, but at their own pace. And to me, that is where the breakdown. What is the point of having a monitoring manual if there is no enforcement of the requirements yeah. of the manual? Yes. And yes. um, the yeah. final thing I would suggest in um, to what Margaret was saying is that there is a simple process in the approval part that we use internally for organizations, which is the delegation of authority. And to me, you cannot, what is done now, is there is a constraint for the CEOs or the MDs to be the same as a public, um, as the PS in terms of financial authority. And is that realistic if you have a truly, um, if you have an entity like a CAL or NGC, a heritage operating in a commercial space where they have to be competitive and be able to make certain decisions fast, you know? Um, so those sorts of things, those areas, I think, are the, the nuances we need to look at as we frame a new model mm -hmm. for um, the management of the state enterprises so that we have the boards held accountable, but also the government administration of the day, I think. It, it allows too much. By the time it is surfaced, it's, the parties are gone. Sometimes they're there. There's no way to recoup, you know, and, mm -hmm. and that's something we need to look at. I want to say that um, I support your view on the performance manual, even though it's dated, I have indicated to persons, you know, in facilitating sessions, it has the basic information in there on duties and responsibilities and what is required and the process that even if you take it and you implement some of it, you know, the basics, you should be able to do a good job. And it is not just when I say take it and implement it, it means informing your directors, this is there, this is what we are required to do, ensuring that they know what is necessary so that you can move forward at least with some basic information, additional training or whatever else may be required at times, but you must be able um, to understand it. And I know in some instances, uh, directors have been told that it is loyalty to government rather than um, adhering to or ensuring that the citizen's interest takes prominence. But it, it is a real problem as we try to ensure that these state enterprises, you know, work. I know the Ministry of Finance had a divestment secretariat at one time, um, I think the person would have retired. That's Jerry Hospitalis. Some things were done, but then it just seems to stop. And I myself have asked the question, okay, Ministry of Finance Investment Division that has a PS um, in charge, what can you do to ensure compliance in the state enterprises? What is your role and function? And uh, um, I was told that it has kind of gone south, but the fact is they need to be more vigilant in as state enterprises are convened and um, the boards are put in place, that they have a schedule of some kind to ensure that people are doing what they are supposed to do. You know, I think that's one of their roles that should be adhered to. I have Margaret. I, I um, just wanted to add a little piece to say the state enterprise manual, it may have served this purpose then, but I think, I really think that we should revisit it and make it fit for purpose. And fit yeah. for purpose means when I'm when I'm talking about categorization, because we do it in procurement, if I, if I can categorize a vendor who has a certain amount of spend versus a small vendor with less spend, I will not use the same process for both of them. 
because it will be onerous for the man, for the vendor with the small spend to have to follow the process as somebody with a high spend. So all I'm saying is, is to revisit the manual and make it fit for purpose as suited for the different categories. And that way in terms, of, and that includes everything, how we pay people, how we handle the payment process, how you handle the operational aspect. The same student enterprise manual can be revisited and adjusted to make it more agile and more suitable in, for this current time. That's all. Okay, thank you. That's noted. Any other questions or contributions? Uh, you know, I just want to make a quick comment to yes, uh, Tonya's point mm -hmm. very briefly, and just to give us a, a little bit more hope, as it were, because I think Antonio's point, whether or not we can you know, define a, a sort of broad definition of time frames, so you know, decision makers at state enterprise level and boards and so on can factor that in the timeline for their decision-making processes. It's a very important point, and in fact is one that arose in the ETEC matter. What had happened was that when it is the Minister of Finance alerted the board to the concern initially. So he had said, look, I have a concern about this, uh, this uh, investment and so on. The process for it to sort of get back to the minister took so long that when it is the, the, the response was given, um, uh, Professor Julian, what he said was, he said, well, you know, look, <laughs> we've actually lost value because of how long it has taken for us to get here. And he said, what we are going to have to do is to, to do an investment to sort of make up time. We have to do this aggressive marketing campaign to sort of um, you know, make good the effect of this delay on the investment. So I think the point is very well taken. And I'm hopeful that if we do get a decision on the substantive merits of this case, we should get some guidance on that as well. Because I do expect that when the substantive merits come to light, we will see defenses um, from the, board, the former board of directors suggesting certain things along those lines. I expect that based on how the arguments themselves have sort of developed um, at the lower court level. Okay, thank you. Yes, we are waiting to see. So the question, the question I would ask, and I don't know if the lawyers can answer this, but the question is, um, the level of debate and, and, and discussion within the boardroom, I don't know if we have access to minutes and that kind of stuff. But, but for me, the level to which you encourage the debate, encourage different or dissenting points of view and really engage around what could go wrong and that kind of stuff. And then also the rationale for whatever investment you're making. To the extent that you have vigorous debate, I think it's to the extent that you can reduce the, let's call it the, the extent of um, an adverse outcome. The, the point being that you need to, to, to clearly ventilate all the the pros and cons and what could go right or wrong and, and make sure those are, are well, um, really, really vigorous. Limited. And of course, to, to Terry's point, that the, the, the chain of command is aware of what is going on and why. <clears throat> A certain amount of humility is required. That's what I'm trying to get to. I think I think maybe <clears throat> I think Ronnie should answer your question, but I, before he before he does, I I I I would just point out that Nigel, the, the, the point thing at, at the end of the day for a board is about the decision. <clears throat> okay, so and and some boards record their minutes in a rather parsimonious kind of fashion. They don't <laughs> give you the haji baji of the debate and so on. There's a note. There's a recommendation. There's a decision, um, and and so I think what you're suggesting is that in, for, for, for for you to defend yourself, you need to be able to show that there was this vigorous debate and discussion and so on. But some some boards don't write their minutes in that way. I mean that this, that debate may well take place, and in good it does take place. But you, what you see in terms of the written outcome is maybe very terse and very um, you know. I'd love to hear what Ronnie has to say about that. Uh... Thank you. Um, 
I think collectively, I mean, there's so many, um, there's a basket of remedial measures. I, I, I do feel firstly, and just generally that we should have separate rules for public companies, private companies and state enterprises. That's my start point. So I support, I, I, I support you Terence on that. The second point is really that being an upliftment in the discussions on director education, because we do need to have much more mature and, and, um, and, and uh, chairs, persons who can encourage that discussion or debate that uh, Nigel is speaking of, and who is not turned away by directors who ask difficult questions or shut them up. And, um, and, and that is, and the CCGI and all the work that we're doing here and the discussions I think will ultimately redound to that. But I also feel that we, we do need to have a, a recognition nationally that principle-based governance is really no longer a relevant or material. I think it has to be rule-based. And I say that with regret, huge regret, uh, because I, I do feel that, um, that we do need rules to govern us. We must set out thresholds to determine <clears throat> guilt of us. Um, I, I know Nigel doesn't agree with that in principle. Oh, but totally. I don't agree with you at all. Good. But no, no, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying that there must be no rules. But there has to be some some balance between risk taking and rules, and and principle is what is going to, to, to for me make sure that you you end up with with the the, the most innovative and 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 um, and the most innovative kinds of of um, initiatives. To to rely on rules is is to is to go down a. No. A very, a very um, no, I, unsuccessful I, 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 I agree to an extent because, of course, you can't legislate integrity, even though we have tried with exactly. integrity in the Public Life Act. But, but, but principle base is not worked um, and, and is not working. And it, it, does not it has worked in the private sector. Well, yes, but I think most of the scandals in the private sector we don't hear of. Um, you know, so, but, but I do well, want no, to. In, in the private sector, they go bust and, 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 and they. They, are, they, are, they, 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 they cease to exist and, and, the, and the shareholder suffers. In this case, the shareholder is the, the citizenry. And that's what we have to, to kind of guard well, against. So, so to, in the public sector, may, they, we may need to lean more to the rules, but to say that we should abandon principle, I have a problem with that. No, no, no. Not we a, have to have abandon. some. What I want to <coughs> abandon is, no, is, is to holding you accountable at principles. Because for, right, for those okay. of us in this arena, in this in this room, for instance, I don't need a rule to tell me I must be honest and be and fidelity. Yeah. I, 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 uh, I do that. Uh, but but what I'm saying is that I, the majority <clears throat> of us are not necessarily guided by principles. Uh, and 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 so there has to be, I think, a balance. I also want yes. to make a plug for um for for um for a heightening our enforcement activity in terms of regulation. I think the regulators, and I, I never thought I'd say this, but the regulators probably should be more empowered. Um, having said that, I'm very conscious of the of the of the balance to be etched between the risk of do or the or the the ease of doing business as opposed to box ticking. I'm not sure how I can reconcile one with the other, but but I, I feel we need to, to to develop that. And finally, to make the point about having uh, chairs um, who uh, or chairpersons who not understand not only understand their role and who hopefully would be loyal to the government that it serves, but, but who are appointed not because of the loyalty, but because of competence. And, um, and, and that there ought to be some sort of a um, guide or, or perhaps the, the private sector can provide some sort of entree where those persons can be readily or more readily identifiable. So a government can so to the CCGI, can you identify you know, appropriate you know, persons who we feel we can ask to be a chair of this particular, you know, something like that. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and yeah, so that, that's the point I just wanted to make, Ali. Thank you for giving me that opportunity. Yeah. No, um, I think very good points were made. Uh, I think, Kamala, an, another session would have to be held where we discuss <laughs> only what exactly should the way forward be and what should the CCG <laughs> I, uh, advise government that they should do going forward because we really need to make steps forward. And we have been speaking, yes, but I think as an institute and an organization, especially given the base, it has an international base, you know, we should be able to start making some inroads into 
getting changes, because a lot of suggestions, you know, are coming forward that we absolutely need to consider and consider seriously, you know? So I want to thank everyone for um, their contributions. I think this has been very instructive. It also points to the fact that we need a lot of additional work to be done. And um, where we sit, I think all of us have the concerns and will be willing to help contribute to the way forward. Kamla. Thank you very much, Aline. Um, I, I wasn't sure if your panelists would have had any more time because I know I know Ronnie, for instance, is, is, is you know, his time is always in, in demand, or else he would have been with us even earlier today. Uh, but um, what has happened is our next set of panelists, uh, we had two. Uh, officials from the Ministry of Finance out of Jamaica. They've just okay. been asked to evacuate their building. So they um, will not be um, oh likely to join us yeah, for a short while. Um, Oliver Jordan <coughs> is at board meeting still. So he too is um, not likely to join. And Charles Smith out of St. Martin just got called by his minister. For <laughs> <Jordan>. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so we we look like we don't have a, a panel for the next session. So, you know, I, I was quite happy to have the this panel continue the, the conversation. Um, and, and what I feel very strongly about is the fact that all persons here are really genuinely given of, of their time and, and are honestly motivated by how can we help develop yes. the region better and, and, mm -hmm. yes and and as you say Aline you know CCGI has really um done some work we, we are in a position now where we have a very big regional um gathering of of persons um so the the reality is we can position ourselves, and I think we have a, a truly talented board that, that's given great leadership, that we can at least try to continue to, to bring the voices together in a very rational way. How can we bring the kinds of improvements we want? You know, we, we really ought not to fail people like um, Mr. Ken Gordon and all the efforts that they have made to, to try and improve a society. Uh, we, we too really owe it to, as he said, not wait for the younger ones to be taught what ethics is. We, we, we big enough, we old enough to know what it is and to want to, to make that difference. And, and, and Nigel knows, I mean, he, he says it all the time and so does Faith, that I seem to have boundless energy. That's because I'm, I'm so motivated by thinking <laughs> we can make a difference, we can. And, and because I feel so very strongly, I'm, I'm very happy to work with everyone here. Let us figure out what is the way we can, we can make this work. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if persons have a few more minutes, I just want to ask, because I think that this conversation is, is quite important. Ona, I know that um, you were looking forward to the panel this evening. Um, Christopher, I hope I can take a little bit more of your time, but if, but if we can't, you'll tell me, right? Um, I'm here. Good. Excellent. So we were going to look at structures of state enterprises. And, and I was really interested in the Jamaican story because of the kinds of restructuring that they have done, where they have been using a lot of executive agencies as the means by which they're getting things done in the, the public sector. And, and so I'm hoping that we will be able to get them to share, you know, at, at some point. But um, Ona, would you be able to, to share with us? We could probably have a, a short discussion on it. And, and Aline, I'll be happy if you would be able to, to contribute mm -hmm. to in terms of the effort that we have been making here in Trinidad and Tobago as well, to see how we, we really try to, to get what is the right um, structure here first. Right, so Dr. Farrah, I, I understand that you need to go, yeah. Let me tell you, um, Kamla, mm -hmm. I, the Petrodram instance, um, I was one of the persons asked to facilitate an uh, a information sharing session coming out of the fallout, you know, um, of what happened there. 
-hmm. And I did it, it was a retreat. The prime minister organized for his cabinet and the permanent secretaries. And we shared, and I could barely, I mean, as I'm talking about the duties, et cetera, he is interrupting all the time to say, yes, you're hearing what she's saying. You're hearing what she's saying. He was leading the change, you know. He was determined that this should not happen again. And right then and there, he even spoke to the fact that, um, and I don't know, I, I hope it, it has been kept. I mean, they have reviewed the um, public bodies regulations. Um, he indicated, especially to his political ministers who are grassroots and down there that persons that you all are considering to put on boards, you have to <clears> ensure <throat> that they must be qualified. Because one of the things we did in the session was to say what or the kind of skills, um, I think it's Miriam, uh, Mariam, who spoke to it this morning, the kind of skills and competencies necessary for persons on the board, you know, um, I know here, yes, we had the database, and I think in that time, they would have looked at resumes recommended and did their due diligence to some extent before making recommendations, but it even needs to go further. And the whole, just the insistence when you create a board that the um, chair, the GM, needs to um, put in place training and facilitation and um, induction or onboarding, lead the organization. Those are critical be before you start any work, any business in that state enterprise. So people know what they are about. And you should have the leeway to say, and, and I'm not really, casting aspersions on political persons, but they're political persons who don't care really and wants to get into the organization when they shouldn't. But if that happens, the chair should be able to go to the Minister of Finance to say, this person is not working out. This person will not help our agenda moving forward. And if you want to see the objectives or the strategic objectives, of government and the organization met. We need to ensure that this person, because sometimes that one dissenter, in which might be frivolous, could delay or really put a spoke in, in the kind of time frames of how you do things, you know? And, and even spread, you know, we have a, a, a real issue now with fake news and, and bad information. Those kinds of things can happen, which can just, delay or derail what you're trying to do so uh, there are sometimes and then we could you know sit and discuss some of these things there are sometimes some short or small things that could be done as i say insistence by the political directorate that these things should happen that could be half the battle one especially given the number of state enterprises we have on the ground mm -hmm. which are way too many Yes. All right. Um, oh, now I want to invite oh, now. you. Yeah, mm -hmm. now, so we, we can um, just uh, take the, the conversation forward a little bit. Now, I know that uh, we invited you as a moderator and uh, not necessarily as a panelist. So if you are not comfortable to share in certain areas, that's fine. But because you work with the, the um, Barbados Water and, is that Water and Sewerage Authority? Forgive me, I, I should have... Oh. Uh, Barbados Water Authority. Right, the Barbados Water uh, uh, Authority. Authority. Um, yeah. Joan, can you bring um, Ona in into the uh, panel as well? Thanks. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we have been looking at the fact that um, there is a real issue here in Trinidad and Tobago with our uh, Water and Sewerage Authority in terms of needing a restructuring so there's greater accountability within the, the, the whole system. And, and that may be similar for some of the other statutory authorities which we have in, in Trinidad and Tobago. What is the structure that you have there and, and is it working? Well, again, thank you first for inviting me and throwing me into this position. 
Um, I, I don't mind. That is quite all right. Um, I've actually sat on a couple statutory boards myself as a director. So I've seen it from both sides. What I will say is I think that some there, there appears to be some recognition that things cannot continue the way how they were being done. And um, we had a new public finance management act passed, I think it was in 2019. And then we had the categorization of um, state-owned enterprises into commercial state-owned enterprises and non-commercial state-owned enterprises. So we've had some little incremental movement in what I would say is looking like the right direction. And I'm choosing my words very carefully. But I think that we still have some way to go and some ground to make in terms of the governance structures and, and, and the boards and so on. I'm not 100% convinced that we are yet in the position that we could be. And I take the point that Arlene has been making and I've been listening to what she's been saying. And I think that for us, we still have, yes, the board members are political appointees. I think there's some effort to get people who are professionals and who have a certain level of experience on boards. So you have attorneys, you have people who are skilled in management, you have people who know something about procurement. But I still think that there's too much room for them not to be all fair. So the onboarding and those kinds of things don't happen. At least I've not seen it happen, which is why I've been advocating quietly for some sort of training for people, because it's one thing to appoint you as a board member, but you've never sat on a statutory board. You don't know what it's supposed to do. You're not familiar with the legislation. You don't know. And I think it's a disservice to someone who genuinely wants to serve to be thrown into this position and not be given the um, at least some sort of a platform or some sort of basis on which mm -hmm. to, to, to launch your operations. And of course, we know that at the end of the day, as Arnie said, you are a political appointee. And I think that you are going to operate in a certain way. And I think, too, that that needs some work. I don't know how you get around it, especially since it is a government appointed board. But I think that at the end of the day, from what I've seen and where I've sat, and I've sat on a board myself, that we make sure that boards operate in a certain way and that the company has a proper governance framework and policies and tools and that the boards um, follow and implement the governance system and governance structure. I don't know that we have a governance structure per se. I've never heard of it. I've never seen any policies written or other ways that deal with governance. I think it's something we talk about and it's in the air. And I myself sometimes, because I'm in charge of legal and regulatory, will issue my little guidance notes here and there. And I will say, well, hey, we need to make sure that we, we are doing the, 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 the governance properly and this is what's supposed to happen. But as far as the company or the organizations, the SOEs having a set governance framework, I don't think that we're there yet. And I don't know how we're going to get there either. You see, oh, now one of the things I think that you can do, that you started doing, you spoke about the little governance notes, fine. But boards can also take responsibility for training up their directors. They don't really have to wait on government. If the board is of the mind, especially the chair, that things need to be done, persons, knowledge, skills, and information needs to be enhanced, the board should be able, working with the GM, to go out and get that kind of assistance. Good? That is where it is no. Um, it is something that I've done. Uh, had one of our board meetings we it is okay so if the board meeting takes two hours um have one hour half an hour to discuss share duties of the board what is the structure where they're responsible for and you you share that normally you find it's an eye opener but at least you have started you know and then you go further with respect to um, the information and the board itself can discuss what are some of the key things that they need to know. You know, one of the main things, yes, you're dealing with the government of the day and their um, priorities, but it has to come from whatever strategic plan is in place. And that is reading material. And I know it's not everybody who <laughs> likes to 
read and research, mm -hmm. but it could still be done where people could understand this is why I'm here. This is what we are supposed to achieve, you know. So the entity itself, once there is a will, can also make some of those kinds of changes. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. And I think that it would be good if the board saw that as something that they should undertake. I don't know, again, that we are there yet. Um, yeah. you know, but maybe it's something that can be suggested. I'm, I'm yeah. fine with that because I do agree with you. And I do think that the training and making sure that you, you have, you have your structures and your systems in place and that you match the strategic plan. And if the organization does not have a strategic plan, get in a strategic plan in place so that it lines up with yes. your governance model and so on. So that at the end of the day, we know, well, this is the framework in which we're operating and that we can then use this as a launch pad to go forward. But I'm not convinced that our governance structures are, are properly in place mm -hmm. at all. I'm sorry, I, know, I just don't one, see that. One of the main duties of the board is to ensure that there is a strategic direction articulated so the board can look at what is the government's strategic plan and pull out from there what they are supposed to do and share that downwards once they are in, uh, you know, agreement mm -hmm. so it's um sometimes people feel a strategic plan must be this big document that hardly anybody understands and doesn't have an implementation part to it. yes <laughs> but but a, a smaller focused document that even shows priorities could be helpful you know yeah, All right. so, uh, if, if I may just add, um, so Ona, you know, you, you have said that you're not sure if, if your governance structures are where it, it ought to be yet. And, and I, I want to share because I know that Oliver has shared this with us publicly. So there is an exercise currently taking place, which he is okay. leading to have a, a, a understanding of how to restructure the entire system to see which where there's overlap and duplication and that kind of thing. And that's going to be a huge exercise, which he shared with us in a, in, in a very public session here with um, CCGI. Um, in fact, and I'm remembering too, that there was an invitation to him that when he's finished with Barbados, come to Trinidad and Tobago, because <laughs> we have to similarly do a kind of rationalization as well yeah. and see which of the state enterprises that are working which ones are just there and not accomplishing anything and you know save on resources so that 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 is done better yes i am aware of the sorry to, to, to cut you down there. i am aware of the um the effort and i know I, I we actually heard which enterprises could be married and which ones could be phased out and so on because you had two and three and four doing basically the same path and i know that there has already been some movement in that area so that is good. I think that, that's why I said, I think that we are on the road pointing in the right direction. Yes. I just wish I could hurry them along to get there. <laughs> okay. 